today is International Women's Day, and uh, I've got more messages from people saying, you know, celebrate, let's celebrate whatever, you know, all these kinds of, uh, uh, so we're also being streamed on Facebook now. Uh, so, and I just thought, wait a minute, my late mother always used to say, what is this nonsense about Mother's Day, Father's Day, Women's Day? Every day should be a Women's Day, every day should be a Mother's Day, that's what she used to say. She just couldn't understand the kind of commercialization and uh, commodification of even basic values you know, among our families. And uh, something that wasn't there about 10 years ago, but now it's become very big. Uh, our social media channels, television, radio, everything has gone into this mode of uh, commercialization of our values. Uh, but that's the way it is. That's what globalization is all about. And we have a choice. And uh, like today, you know, the theme is for International Women's Day, uh, we choose, you know, we, we, we have chosen today that Dr. Yashoda Thakur and I have a conversation. But before I get to that, I, I want to share with you why exactly uh, we do International Women's Day uh, here at Anand National University. Before this, for the past six years, ever since I've come back after nearly 40 years internationally, mostly in Australia, I did International Women's Day with a particular reason in Amaravati. Because Amaravati is a twin panchayat, Amaravati Dharnakota. And uh, women who are born there, what in Telugu we call Arapadatsu, they marry and they leave the village. They go to another village, go to Hyderabad, they go to Guntur, Vijayawada, they go to Ahmedabad. But then women from outside marry the local men and they come to Amaravati. But when they come to Amaravati, their status is reduced to the total minimum self-esteem denied because they're conditioned to become daughters-in-law, which means I do not want to describe to you. It's very tough for them. Uh, they can't even go out of the front door. So what we did was we used the museum as a civic space to enable uh, daughters-in-law to come together, meet uh, each other, get to know each other, uh, learn Kuchpudi, for instance. We had a Kuchpudi teacher who, uh, graduate from Kuchpuri, who lives locally. She met, she's a daughter-in-law. So we used to do all kinds of things, but International Museum Day was always about issues. And it was part of a program called Mawuru Ma Kordolo, that means our village, our daughters-in-law, the range of issues that they face. And it attracted quite a bit of attention. I mean, in the media, uh, nationally, and even internationally, quite a bit, especially in Europe this whole notion of endogamous and exogamous marriages and how it actually structures, you know, the, the way women uh, are situated in, in these villages. And, uh, but thanks to the pandemic, I'm here in Ahmedabad and thanks to Anand National University who support very generously uh, the webinars. We don't charge, they're free. Uh, and uh, uh, you can also access the recording free of cost and download free of cost. Uh, so uh, we, we are going to have our 14th webinar. And the reason that we have a particular focus for this on Kalavantulu, or you know, what were called Devadasis until it became quite derogatory, thanks to British colonialism and those Indians who inherited uh, the colonial gaze, you know, sort of uh, Indian civil servants and others. And he uh, said uh, in Amaravati, uh, two years ago, I started revitalizing intangible heritage uh, through oral history programming and the memory of old people, both men and women, in 20 different civic spaces. And a couple of them happened to be in temples, uh, but the smaller temple had no tradition of uh, Kalavantulu or Devadasis uh, in the past before it was made illegal. But they did have Tolubomalata, that means leather puppetry. So we revitalized that. But in the main temple, uh, the 
the Kalavantala Devdasi system was there until it was made illegal. So when we actually introduced dance uh, to, uh, into the temple, there was a certain issue because some of the people, uh, you know, especially upper caste people, wanted the performance to be in front of the uh, uh, Lord over there, that is Amalangeshwar, in the hall where the musicians usually play every day. They wanted it there. Uh, but I, as an organizer, I had two challenges. One is that, am I revalidating, you know, what had become, uh, you know, quite derogatory towards the end, you know, and demeaning for people who actually were custodians of our music and dance uh, in our society by doing that. Second thing is, it was inaccessible for elderly people. A lot of elderly people were helping me. It was not accessible because they had to go up the stairs. If you, those of you know Amaravati, or the five, the Pancharamas, the five sacred sites to Shiva, they, you all always have to go up one stair of, uh, one flight of steps to go to the top, very steep stairs. And it's always on the first floor you worship Shiva. I've studied all the five lingers and uh, all of them, you know, are. Uh, Buddhist Aika Thambas, because at the bottom of the one in Amaravati, there's an inscription which says, dating back to about first century BC, that this Aika Thamba was given by such and such Vanija, the Prince Trader, in about first century BC, during the time of the Satavahanas. However, it's quite common in India, and especially in Andhra Pradesh and Karnataka, to source uh, stone uh, from abandoned sites and carve them and use them in temples. And it's still done to this day. It's quite common. So it wasn't that they took something away. Uh, they, they saw it as quarry material. The abandoned super was seen as a stone quarry and they quarried stone out of that. You know, the linga was uh, fabricated. So we had it in front of Sri Krishna Devaraya Tula Paramandapam, you know, so 15, 15 AD was built. So it went well, but the question came about that where did the Devadasis actually perform and what kind of performances did they do? Uh, is there only one type or is there a diversity, diversity in performance uh, depending on when and where? So the whole question of design of spaces, you know, based on knowledge, ritual, and ceremony, uh, and also the, the, the architectural context of where these performances took place started interesting, uh, interesting me as I was doing research because I'm in, in a university where we have excellent uh, school of design and faculty of architecture and a new school of creative practice practices. So, then I thought, okay, you know, Dr. Yashoda Thakre, you know, um, so most of you know, Google her. And uh, I will ask her if she would have a conversation because she does come from the Kalavantra community. She's a, quite an accomplished and very well known Kuchpudi and Bhatanatyam dancer. Uh, she also believes in intergenerational transmission, she teaches the next generation. And most importantly, she has dedicated her life to document, research the Kalavantula community and their living here, their intangible heritage that's dying out so rapidly. And she's documenting because people feel a certain amount of hesitation to talk about their heritage because of the dominant society. So let's start with, you know, the first question, uh, Dr. Yashoda. Thakura, if you don't mind, I'll call you Yashoda. Yes, please. Um, Such a beautiful name, you know, yes. so I'll call you Yashoda yes, and uh, oh. uh, your research and uh, your teaching internationally using blended approaches. You have, uh, 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 it, it's, it's just amazing what you're doing, Yuri, you know, even though it's very challenging. So who are the Kalawantri? Could you... Could you explain to the audience, please? Sure. Now, the term itself is very, very layered, Amar. I can call you Amar, right? You can call me Amar. 
Okay. But remember, you're talking to all the audience. They're looking at Yes, you. I know. Okay. Um, there is this tradition, pan-South Asia, but we will talk about India and particularly about the Telugu land because it is Kalavantulu. But there is this tradition or practice of women being committed to or under contract to temples as they were with the courts simultaneously, whether it's the temple right. or the court. They, so it's not like two, it's not like a chronological thing as temple and then the court. It's the it's at the same time. They were not called the Devadasi. Interestingly, this term Devadasi itself is an influence of the colonial rule. Yeah. Even Kalavantulu was an influence of the colonial rule, interestingly, yeah. because earlier these women who danced in the court and in the temple and sang were called Sanivaru or Bhogamvaru, as um, V.A.K. Rangaragaru, a critique and scholar says, Sanivaru and Bhogamvaru were, were the terms given to the women in the Telugu land. When they start, when these terms starting started getting um, derogatory angle, that was when even this had to be Sanskritized. You know, Sanskrit was now floated as the language of gods, and our own indigenous cultures and languages are all suppressed, and we are made to feel ashamed of our own languages. So it had to be Sanskritized to Kalavantulu which says those who carry art, Kala being art, those who carry art on them. Now this term Kalavantulu is, it confines itself to the women who are dedicated to singing and dancing. I don't like the word dedicated to too much, for whom singing and dancing is the profession, right? And these women were called variously in different areas. They were called Maharis in Orissa. They were called Ishai Velalar in Tamil Nadu, but that again is a later name that they got. They were called Kalavant in Maharashtra. In fact, it's from there that we, the Telugu land, got the name Kalavantulu. So when it came to the term Devadasi, when it comes to the term Devadasi, you muted. Can't hear you. You can't hear me? Now I'm... we can hear you. Now okay. we can hear you. Okay. I'll, it's just that I need to pitch, as Sharvari said. Right. Okay. Um, when it came to the term Devadasi, when the British were preparing their files and in the in as part of their administration, they put us the, the whole of India into categories, right? It, according to what we do or according to our birth. When it came to these women with ambiguous marital status who were not married, they didn't know where to put them because all categorization was based on what the man did. Now here there was, there was no man in their lives, you know. It's so interesting that we are talking about these women who lived by themselves on we are talking about them on Women's Day. So they didn't know where to keep them. And there were more. They were more than just these singer dancers. They were the temple women like Joginis and Matangis, who, whose life is actually in a very bad situation. But they were the ones who were also temple women, only they didn't do the singing and dancing. And they were not part of the ritual as these Sanivaru were. But they put everybody into under this category of Devadasi and called them the Devadasis and gave them a caste. So Kalavantulu became a caste. They were not a caste earlier. They were just families. They were guilds. So once they became a caste, there were implications. There were good things that the men got jobs because there was reservation. But the worst thing is that the women were rendered invisible completely because they were not allowed to dance after that so let, 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 let me ask you this question yeah i mean from all the records uh, uh, the women you know with the gills and uh, who provided 
a range of, you know, uh, creative, ritualistic, you know, support in the society and services, not only temples, but during this uh, Yatra ceremonies and so on. They actually own land. I mean, they own land and they were independent. And uh, with, the, with the British and then subsequently with the, uh, you know, the people who inherited the white man's burden, you know, for, as Indian civil servants, their lands, their, everything is taken away. Uh, Ted, can you tell a bit more about it? Because that totally was devastating, you know, yes, impoverishing yes, people. Absolutely. It, it rings your heart when you talk about this, you know, because these women, they, they were considered, um, they, they were considered a good woman, right? They, so for every situation, in, on every occasion, they had to be there and gifting them and taking care of these women was the norm of the day. Everybody, it's not just the king, it, not, not just the, it was also the moneyed people in society who gave them a lot of respect. The temple, through the temple, these women had manyalu, as they called it. Manyalu were lands and a certain amount of financial support that they got from the temples. Because, because first of all, when we talk about this, Amar, we should be aware of the purpose of the temple. The space of the temple was so inclusive, inclusive in the sense it had so many things that were done there. There, there, was a, there were political transactions, there were marriage alliances, there were, you name it, and it took place in the temple. Administration took place there. And there, were, there was business that took place and God. There was also and God. It was not just, it's not like today. Today, when we talk, look at a temple, it's only God and the priest and more priests, devotees going and coming back. So in this milieu, you had this dancer who was part of the temple and who contributed to the economy of the temple. So in return, the temple gave her maniums and a certain amount of income. And she had rooms, most of the temple, the, the accommodation, whether it was within the temple premises or outside, was given by the temple for these women. Now, what happened to these, uh, they were the ones who took care of the whole family, whether, whether their progeny was male or female, they were the ones who were in charge of the family. After a point when these um, English sensibilities were put into our mind, and then the man was told that he should be man, you know, and he should be the one earning. Uh, then the we began to hate our own traditions and our own people. So the, that's when the patriarchy, that was the death blow, really. Because so patriarchy and that inferiority complex. Yes, yes. You know, looking like we want to be as good as the white man, if not better, you know, sort yes. of the values. <laughs> Uh, people felt ashamed, you know, sort of, uh, and and the, and the irony of it is that it was the, the these are matrilineal families, like you yes. said, the families, you know, depend, you know, they were the main bread earners, yes. matrilineal. I mean, the male members were musicians and yes. uh, uh, involved in the family, but lineage was through the women. They were matrilineal. Yes, and and that was changed with colonial intervention. And then the irony of it all is that India becomes independent yes. on the 15th of August, 1947. And what happens on the 9th of October, 1947? The act is out. Uh, <laughs> the act is out, uh, you know, banning what, you know, dedication, you know, sort of, uh, or the so-called Devdasi Act. And it was enacted right across the Madras presidency, which what included Andhra, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, yes. uh, and uh, enacted by new civil servants who, uh, as uh, Professor Federick calls them, you know, 
the Macaulay boys or the yes, children yes, of sons, Macaulay. Sons, yeah, sons of sons Macaulay. Of Macaulay from the <laughs> colonial times. Just like the jazz mill uh, rhetoric is so deep in India, people keep saying Buddhist sites, Hindu sites, Muslim sites, you know, colonial discourse, you know, after nearly 200 years is still so deeply entrenched. And, uh, and, and this, this thing of, you know, feeling, making feel ashamed yes. by imposing patriarchy hand in hand with the civil, you know, empowered by the civil service, uh, you know, after we became independent to make women, to take away the freedom that India got from women mm -hmm. after India got independence. Uh, I, I think not many people realize that. And I think that a lot of Indians don't realize it. And I think uh, if Indians don't realize it, why should we expect people internationally? Now, you're sure that here is the real problem with so many things in India, uh, like you take Amaravati. Uh, people felt embarrassed to live in Mandava houses, mm. Pantal Mandava houses. So in the six years I've been in Amaravati, almost all except for about three, four Mandava houses have been pulled down and they build these concrete structures. And the only thing when I do focus group research with them is they feel they want to be seen as, you know, they have made it in life. If you got a Mandava house, well, you, you can't afford it. You know, that notion of primitiveness yeah. is so deeply entrenched in, in the mentality of people. And, but this is the kind of colonial mentality. Remember, historically, uh, what are people who are called scheduled tribes, tribal people, Aboriginal people in India, even Ashoka's inscriptions talk about you know, respecting the articles. Now the Ginnara inscription clearly states that. But the British colonial discourse is how uh, primitive tribal people are. And we have inherited this colonial uh, discourse of treating tribal people as primitive and, and yes. so on. And the other thing where I have a question for you after that is, even in the temples, just like the gods, where people went to bathe, suddenly caste didn't exist, you know, so that's people belonging to Brahman caste and people belonging to a Dalit caste, they could bathe side by side, side because in the water, you know, they, they, they transcended, you know, yes. all norms of caste. Similarly, from what I've read, even in the temples when the prasadam is being taken, you know, uh, somebody from a Dalit caste and the Brahmin caste, they could side by side take the prasada. They're transcend. I mean, not now, but traditionally that they could do it. And the Amaravati temple, I always saw its rehabilitation uh, from scratch. Uh, who are the workers? Most of the artisans are Muslim, Sunni Muslims. And women in niqab, you know, coming to the temple for the darshanam, mm -hmm. you know, and just like in Tirupati, they come in. But in a lot of places, they say stop because the British ideas of what is primitive, what is uncivilized, what is civilized. And this has become a stereotype that we have inherited. We have in, uh, internalized this kind of colonial discourse. And, and Devadas sees as, you know, I'm using that word because yes. in popular parlance. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and uh, uh, are the ones who, you know, uh, have been highly victimized, not so much by the British, but those Macaulay's boys, you know, that took over India as civil servants after we got independence. So what happened? You know, suddenly the lands were taken away. They, I mean, I still remember uh, an el elderly gentleman who went on the salt march with Mahatma Gandhi telling me when I was younger, uh, because uh, Tadipali is the place near Amaravati where, you know, it was announced, you know, that India was becoming independent. Everybody wanted to, uh, you know, listen to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, India's tryst with destiny. So they went on bullock carts all the way from Amaravati to listen to the mm -hmm. radio because there was no radio in Amaravati, there only in Thadipalli. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of feeling of freedom and then to take away that freedom the lands, the independence, autonomy of women uh, and make them so vulnerable 
some of the most vulnerable, highly impoverished women in the society. So what, you know, now almost over 70 years of free independence. Yes. So tell us more about you know, the, the community nature, groups. Yeah, the nature of these lands, Amar, was that when it was with the women, they didn't own it. They, it was there, and as long as the woman was there, she could use the produce of that land. The family could live on it, and mm -hmm. her progeny, whether by birth, whether by lineage, blood, or training, whatever the her progeny, female progeny, could then inherit the produce. Mm -hmm. It would be passed on to her, the benefit. But the men had to depend on the on the women. Amen. Yeah. This had to change because the men now wanted, and this land was not taxable, right? Yeah. yeah. And when the men went, when first of all, you must understand that the whole movement for the act to be passed started with men. Yeah. Men from within the community. Men outside the community couldn't really care less. It was mostly the men within the community who wanted it. Men outside the community were the ones who were English trained and who were mostly clerks to the British rule at that time, right? Clerks yeah. in the sense, psychologically, uh, who were not well, quite... They were clerks. They were clerks. <laughs> they were clerks. So it was who, were, who thought they were British, but who were all English trained, but they were not quite, they, they just stopped yeah. at a point. So they were only too happy to take this on from the men. It was the men from within the community who pushed and pushed for this. And there were a few women who wanted it because they were also psyched and they were, they were promised a whole, that the land would come on their name. The women were promised. Yeah. Once the land, the act was passed, these lands became taxable once the lands became taxable, the men could claim the land too. So quickly, the, the women were stripped of the land and any benefits that they got. Once they're stripped of the land and they're asked not to dance, they could not dance in temples, pandals, they still cannot. The act stays, by the way. They, they can't dance anywhere, marriage, marriage parties, temples, festivals. These women could not dance. Anybody else could dance. Mm -hmm. So as Avanti Meduri and Amrit Srinivasan say, simultaneously what was happening was these women were systematically rendered invisible while another dance form was being constructed in yeah. by the upper class Brahmins. So it, it was very systematic. What was replacing the dance? the dance of these upper caste dancers families with their sensibilities which are now which are now british sensibilities yeah so the same shringara padam that the ladies danced with very honest shringaram or love was now danced very carefully with with a lot of uh, vigilance you know uh, mm. completely shown of the shringara so that's the style that was formed at that time. So then the justification that we are given for this is at that point of time when the Britishers were leaving and we had to project India to the, to the world as a, as a very esoteric spiritual place, we could not project these women who, are, who have an ambiguous state in the country. So we had to do this as a very esoteric, philosophical, pure, it's a, it's a word I hate, pure dance. So that, that's how you have, and by the way, I'm not a Bharatanatyam dancer, I'm a Kuchipuri and yeah. Devadasi dancer. So that's quickly men started taking over the dance too. They were accompanying all the time. In fact, in Tamil Nadu, the, the Natuvanar families and the Pillai families, uh, they, they were all the time in dance. Here too, 
in Andhra, you know Kuchipudi, the place of Kuchipudi, yeah. right beside uh, Vijaywada. We have the Kuchipudi Brahmins, Brahmin men, dancing. They do the Bhama Kalapam. They do a solo repertoire, <coughs> which very interestingly, you find most of that in the Devadasi style too, in the Kalavantula repertoire too. Mm -hmm. So the similarity is uncanny between the but two. But what gets funded? I mean, Kuchipudi. Kuchipudi gets funded. Absolutely. The Kuchipudi. The upper caste dance. Upper, yes. upper caste dance gets funded. Yes. But not, at, you know, the, the original carriers and transmitters no. of the Kalavantul community. No. Where are they, Amar? Where are they? If, yeah. if I have to go back to my family and I say, Anaya, please, let's have, let's have uh, the daughter come to dance and sing. Now we are all doing well. They make sure and ask me, if I give her dancing, will it be Kuchipuri that she will learn? And not what you are doing, not the Devadasi one. Yeah. So, uh, so there, there, there is this whole hierarchy. So the, the challenge in India, not only with uh, what we're talking about, uh, is also with architecture and a whole range of things, yes. is the intersectionality of coloniality and modernity. Uh, people haven't yes. really thought about decolonizing the discourse. It's only now beginning to happen. And uh, yes, because no. lock, stock, barrel, we, like you said, we are trying to show the world that we are civilized. Yes. Because the British made us feel so humiliated culturally. And then we reinvent the German Oriental, Orientalist thought of uh, Max Muller and others that the Occident is materialistic, the Orient is spiritual. So here yes. comes India, yes. you know, the, the spiritual, you know, land. And so they started doing that and it had to be pure, as you said, you know, whatever that pure is, how it's qualified uh, yeah. within the context of colonialism. So, so, I mean, I know you're documenting and there's, you're trying to, uh, you know, uh, safeguard as much as you can, but you're one person and, and you also find many of your own family members don't want to be associated with this uh, because of the status. Now, what can institutions like uh, Sangeet and Academy and all this, can they do something about it? Because you know how Indians are so status conscious that if somebody is given a Sangeet Nautic Academy Award who comes from the Kalamantal community, suddenly people think, oh, you know, that's not bad, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, how do we, you know, the establishment has to validate and the establishment is not doing it because the establishment is now taken over by upper caste people mostly and bureaucracy uh, and a bureaucracy, you know, like we, said, you know, uh, the Macaulay boys, you know, sort of, uh, uh, we're all trying to be more British than the British, you know, yes. and uh, now that new educational program, which you know quite well, talks about Indic knowledge. I'm not talking about nationalist. Uh, I think that's all awful. We don't want that. <laughs> but actually understanding and respecting one's own sense of place, one's own knowledge system. So with the kind of documentation that you're doing, is it possible in the next generation, you know, maybe in our lifetime, you know, is it possible to uh, revitalize or, uh, you know, I don't know what term to use. Uh, it will it'll never be the same because intangible heritage is living heritage is constantly changing and evolving. Yes. It's dynamic, but there are certain ethos that you talk about. Could you tell us what those ethos are? So these attempts have been done, Amar. The, there is a form called Andhra Natyam, which has come, which is based on the dance of the Kalavantulu. And actually the first person who documented all this, and we don't have enough of the documentation, <laughs> he's no more, is Dr. Nataraja Ramakrishna. And then there was Mrs. Swapna Sundari. If we are just talking about the dance part of it, there was, uh, there is Mrs. Swapna Sundari who has collected a lot of material and it's with her and she performs that. Uh, but she does it 
in the way she has reconstructed it, the way she visualizes it. And in her own words, it's, it's the way she thinks, she says it to suit the modern, modern day audience. So my take is absolutely art lives on patronage, right, Amar? Mm -hmm. Any day the patron has to, uh, is the one who gives life to the art. So the government, who is the patron today? We don't have kings. It is the government and it is the Department of Culture, Sangeet Natak Academy, which can play a big role in the documentation of this repertoire. There is a danger. How do we have so many dance forms, whether it is Odissi, Bharatanatyam, Kathak, Kuchipuri, Mohini Atam, all of them have emerged from the dance of these women these dancing women, hereditary dancing women. Where did the material come from? Now they dance for stotrams and kirtanams, tyagaraja kirtanas and all that, but the original material is, is from the Devadasis, right? Yeah. So our fear is that when once the material is given, we want it to be danced to the extent possible in the original way. And already these forms are, are done to suit today's audience. Why do it again? Can we keep one it, as it used to be danced, historically keep it going so that when some, some student of dance wants to see it, there is a reference for the, that student. So our fear in just putting it out there is that there could be dancers who can change it to suit their own tastes and sensibilities. Now, do we want that to happen is another question. What happened with Bharatanatyam? Bharatanatyam, the same Padam and the, and the Varnams that the, these women danced, is danced in a completely different way, which has nothing to do with what they did. But if that can be taken care of, absolutely the government can do a lot. Now, there is a question that's, that's come through, uh, in your opinion, would reviving the dance form do justice to the art with respect to how the understanding of discipline dedication has changed with time? Okay, when it comes to dancers, dancers who are dedicated to dance, today, today's dancers are actually quite dedicated they do a, a lot of fitness training and uh, they, they do a lot of learning and practicing. But my appeal is that they need to find out what the history is. Yeah. So if they know the history, just physical dancing will not do Amar. Mm. It, it's not enough. It's just, it's just the tip of the iceberg, you know, and it dies out. After a while, that kind of cosmetic dance just dies out. The dancer has to understand that when she is dancing or he is dancing, he's carrying a whole history on his body, on her body. That lineage, that history, that, that poet, that, that, that nuance of that word uh, when the poet wrote it and the poet's experience, what made the poet write it, this dancer is carrying that. It's not about the dancer. It's about that. So. I think this can be done with whatever form you're doing. Even if you're dancing Bharatanatyam, please be sensitive to find out where it has come from, whatever you are doing, who has written it, in what condition, in what space, and what has influenced this person to write it, who else has danced it, in what areas, and who has taught this to me, what is my position now? Respect. The key respect. word is respect. Yes, absolutely. And, and this is one, one of the four objectives of the UNESCO 2003 Convention on Safeguarding Intangible Heritage. Yes. First thing is awareness raising. Yes. Second thing is documentation mapping. Third thing yes. is, you know, mutual respect. You know, sort of you've got to have respect. Now, to tell me, gosh, you know, one of my, uh, the, the questions coming here, uh, you know, a good example of mainstream, mainstreaming of the community was 
through Hindi cinema, like, you know, Jaddan Bai, this is the mother of Nergis. We all know who yes. Nergis is. Yes, Nergis. But uh, Jaddan Bai. And are there any such stories in Telugu cinema or Southern cinema? Oh, so many. You, you must read um, Celluloid Classicism by Hare Krishnan. He talks right. about it, about the time. Okay, okay, audience, of... Celluloid Classicism. classicism. By Remember, Hare Krishna. this is for the audience because English <laughs> is not the first language for most of the, our audience. So. Celluloid classicism and then... Uh, by whom? For, by, sorry. Could by Hare Krishnan, that? Professor Hare right. Krishnan. Right. When it comes to the Telugu side of it, we have um, Ramya Pucha, who has been writing quite a bit about Telugu cinema and dance. R-U-M-Y-A-P-U-T-C-H-A. That's how she pronounces. So I'm having to say Ramya Pucha. So there is so much. You must understand that the first female artist who came to gramophone recording, theater and cinema were the Devadasis, were the Kalavantulu and the Isha Velalar, you know, in Tamil Nadu. They, they were ready-made. See, cinema came like that. It didn't prepare you. It just came, gramophone came like that. And who was ready to sing? The ready-made artists were them. Who was, they were doing it all the time. So you have Bangalore, Nagaratnama, you have Gauhar Jan and all of them. They were the only ones who could go and sing for recording. And they were the only ones who could act like that day and night at any point of time, just on a cue. So there are so many stories. But then, um, as Hari says in his book, it's interesting that after a certain period of time, when, when society got that much time to work on themselves, then there was a systematic move towards marginalizing these women from the cinema field also. So in Tamil cinema especially, they worked towards bringing in uh, the upper class, upper caste, I'm sorry, that's a dog. <laughs> the, bringing in the upper caste the actors into the movie, movie field. Yeah. That, so it, 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 yeah. this has happened across the world. Uh, like if you, uh, if you take uh, tango in Argentina, you know, in in the about 120 years ago, I quote unquote, no woman who had any dignity or status would do tango. So who would do the tango with men? The men, you know, coming from Italy and Germany, various places to Argentina. Uh, it's a Native American women. They would do that. But after the First World War, you suddenly started getting more Italian, Spanish women coming. And suddenly what was the livelihood for Native American women who contributed to the evolution of tango, suddenly they were marginalized because the stereotype, colonial stereotype in Argentina is Native American women have loose morals, just like in India. Uh, you know, how the British and then the Babujis, you know, reduced and stereotyped Devdasis as sex workers, you know, and uh, it was a way of marginalization, power relations, uh, you know, uh, in India or Argentina. So it seems to, it, it's happened in so many places. Now, I know that India is obsessed with world heritage and the heritage so the very Eurocentric term called authenticity is loved in this country. Yes. It has to be authentic. Uh, I still remember somebody asked me when I first went to JNU, are you an authentic, you know, Andhra person? I said, what do you mean by authentic? So do you wear a loincloth? There's somebody from St. Stephen's asked me, you know, do you wear a loincloth authentic? So people still ask, they use this colonial word authentic because of World Heritage uh, you know, language in this country that's popular. Because again, in World Heritage inscription, trying to promote it for tourism, India is also struggling with its own lack of self-esteem to show we have the Taj Mahal, we have this, we have that. I mean, that, that undertow, that undertow is there. So now people ask, you know, where can we see the authentic Kalawantulu? 
there was a there was a dance. I mean, why they're searching? I mean, this is the same with the British colonial impact of Aboriginal people, tribal people in India. Mm -hmm. We're all wearing, you know, 20, 21st, 22 decades into 20th century, wearing contemporary clothes. But we expect in this country tribal people to look with bone arrow like at Andhra, you know, tribal affairs. They still expect churches to be in a loincloth and bone arrow. But if they wear trousers and a shirt, well, you can't be Aboriginal, right? Uh, so this, this is actually systemic racism that's there. Yes. And do you encounter this kind of racism, you know, in your own personal life? I'm sure you have encountered. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a non-question, but uh, I would like you to say something about it. When I was younger, yes, Amar. So uh, when you talk about racism, uh, Amar, by the time I began to reclaim my my roots and I got into the Devadasi whole uh talking about it. Remember, we don't talk about our caste or our background. Yeah. When you don't belong to an upper caste, you don't talk about it, right? Yeah. So uh, by the time I began to talk about it, I was quite well placed in society because my father did very well. He came from very, very modest background, very modest um, beginnings. Then he retired as additional managing director, Road Transport Corporation. So by then, I was properly placed in society and I had this bubble where I thought and I didn't know anything about the background. And, and I got to know from outside, people around you know, when you don't, when you belong to a lower caste, whether you know it or not around you, everybody else knows it, right? Yeah. So, they make it their business to know. Exactly. <laughs> they, it's, it's a major activity <laughs> yeah. so and then they made sure i got to know about it i was only too excited because i was already dancing by then i was dancing even without knowing where i come from yeah. and then it made it it just validated what i was doing you know getting to know about it but when you talk about racism more than my own experience which are i do have my experience but then i would i must talk about the rest of my cousins and my aunts. Today, if I cannot bring one person from the family to get the generation after mine, when I tell them, please bring your children back to singing and dancing, these are, and these children are children, are daughters of CEOs and, you know, very well placed people. When I say bring them back to singing and dancing, I can't bring one person. So what kind of racism do you think they have suffered? What kind of um, marginalization, discrimination do you think they would have suffered? When I, when I hear them tell me how they would speak, they, on the surface, they're all very nice because they're educated and they, are, they are do well. They have a lot of, you know, there is this hyper need to be respectable in society in our families, right? Mm -hmm. you, you can't, there is a limit on how many inches your smile has to be. Because you, you can't- Otherwise you can't get your daughters married. It's a simple Yes. Aspect. Or you can get married yourself if you're a teenager. Yeah. You only smile that much. You only smile that much. Are you, oh my God. No, yeah. Don't laugh beyond so many decibels. Yeah. Uh, so that's not dignity. So, so what you're saying is what, uh, uh, the anthropologist, uh, the sociologist, uh, Leigh Demen Srinivas, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, argued that in India, mobility was possible based on actual status. Yes. You have the ritual status and you have actual status, but the ritual status of their diocese has been totally diminished, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to by the time India got independence. Mm -hmm. And then if the actual status the economic status, the actual status is there, then you were able to reclaim some of that ritual status. Am I right? Yes, yes. That's exactly what happened with me. Because, because of my actual status, thanks to my father, I was in a position to turn around and say, okay, if people are trying to insult me take, by using the word Kalavantulu, 
I will use it myself. I will yeah. say that I'm from here. Then what is it they can say about me? So that's exactly what happened to me. And when it comes to the status of these people within the dancing communities itself, Amar, it, I'm very happy that there is the next generation which has come to dance. It's not, dance by itself is not easy for anyone, Amar. Unless you're dancing, you know, till you get married. Tell, tell, tell our audience what Pelichupula becomes. <laughs> Pelichupulu is when um, the girl comes of age to get married and then she's showcased to the family of the boy to whom she's supposed to get married. And yeah. the boy is chosen by the parents, of course. And the boy with the family comes to see the girl if, if she's good enough for him. So the boy has to accept. The girl accepting or not is incidental. This this whole ritual is called the Pelli yeah, So at she, the yeah, sorry. Go on. So in a certain area, at a certain period, singing, learning to sing and dance and learning to write also was only to the extent, learning to write only to the extent that you can make basic calculations in in the house household calculations, singing and dancing so that you can sing in this ritual and tell the boy that you have a beautiful voice and you have a good gait and you can dance a little bit. After marriage, all this is dropped. Yeah, yeah. but uh, th this is, we have passed that stage too, at least in urban areas, that stage also has passed. The youngsters dance, they dance very well. Yeah. As I well, said, uh, yeah. The, the questions coming, lots of them. Can Yashoda Ji help us understand very briefly how the forms differ? Like, say, Kuchpudi and the Kalabantala tradition is the music, the mudras, the text different? So, the Kalabantala tradition came basically from practice, it did not come from a text. All texts have documented what existed whether it is the Kalavantulu or even if it is Sanskrit, the language of the gods, they have only documented what human beings have danced. And at a very indigenous level or at a human level, there is no text for the Kalavantulu. When it came to Kuchipudi, Kuchipudi is a very beautiful combination of the indigenous Pagati Vesham, the daylight theater, the Yakshagana, which is also a theater which developed from the Pagativesham, it's a combination also of the Devadasi repertoire, the Kalavantulu solo repertoire. There is a streak of Bhama Kalapam in that. So that forms Kuchipudi where it becomes complete as a theater, as a solo form, as a semi-theater. It, it's a very um, comprehensive, nice packaged form. Okay. When it comes to Bharatanatyam, so there's a lot of theater in Kuchipuri. When you come, when it comes to Bharatanatyam, it is a direct takeoff from the Devadasi repertoire. So you don't have so much theater in it. It is mostly a solo form. When it comes to Odyssey, Odyssey is again the Odyssey that you see today is only formed in the 1950s. It's not what the Maharis used to do. So this Odyssey that we see today is the is the taste of Kelu Babu, Kelu Charan Mahapatra. So sure, the sculptures have contributed and um, a little bit of the Maharis, I hope, has contributed, but it's completely different from what the Maharis used to do yeah. at that time. There's a question here. What is Vilasani Natyam? No, okay. <laughs> Vilasani Natyam is the one that is performed by Mrs. Swapna Sundari. So, Mrs. Swapna Sundari, this is this question is definitely from India. Okay, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Swapna Sundari had done her research. She went to the Kalavantulu families, and she collected repertoire. She collected their material and began to reconstruct it, as I said, to suit the present day stage and audience sensibilities, as she thought it would. 
and she gave the name of this form that she has reconstructed as Vilasini Natyam. It is she and the great scholar Arudra. Arudra and she had together have given the name Vilasini Natyam. Okay. It is based on the Kalavanthalu dance, but then it is also made to suit the proscenium stage today. Yeah, so th that that becomes the key issue because no heritage is frozen in time. Yes. It's constantly evolving, it's constantly changing. The question is, how is change determined and by whom? And who by wants whom? Whose <laughs> by who wants whom? whose heritage? Yeah. Yes. So yeah. uh, that, that's the bone of contention in that whole discussion. I don't think I want to get into that now. No. But there's a question here. Is, uh, sometimes, you know, I can't simply say it's a question of apples and oranges comparing them, but is Bonalo dance a heritage of Telangana? If yes, is it still authentic or, or is it, has it been staged and commodified? I don't, I, know if you want to. I, I don't know. I don't know yeah. too much about it. So I, I mean, so the the question here is, you know, the the heritage, the inheritance of the Kalavantulu, mm. you know, is it staged and commodified uh, by other people? I mean, I I know, it, you know, it, it is sad. It is, yeah. It is. So actually, it, it staged, this is. At the making of the dance forms itself is the first stage for this, right, Amar? Yeah. It began there itself. Yeah. And it's just going on now. But then, then when this awareness is created, people become sensitive to it and it's changing again. I think we are going full cycle. Yeah. It's changing. Oh, we got some very keen audience here. <laughs> How is the performance of men dressed as women relevant related to Kalavantaru tradition? Oh, ne they never did that. Yeah. No, never, never, never did that. There was no need. We, women were dancing. So why do we... Men, men, okay, when we did the Bhama Kalapam or the Golla Kalapam, the character of Krishna or the character of the Brahmin in the Golla Kalapam was performed by another Brahmin scholar who would just do that role and go. Gola Kalapam is the milkmaids. Yes. So yeah. Gola Kalapam is very interesting. Gola Kalapam. Yeah, no, well, you got to remember a lot of people are not from India. So yeah. you have to tell them what <laughs> Gola Kalapam is. So both these Kalapams as Bhama Kalapam and Gola Kalapam are semi-theatres. They just have two or three characters who are coming there and presenting a certain situation through dialogue, dance, and collected material to the audience. There is, there is a logical flow to that whole presentation. So when I say Golla Kalapam, it, Golla, Golla Bhama is the milkmaid. And in this particular story, it is the Gola Bhama, the milkmaid who is considered as a lower caste and who sells milk to everybody, goes to the Brahmin priest and that day she, when she's selling milk and buttermilk, all milk products, she's in this mood to tease him a little bit. So she questions him and challenges him about his scholarship and his lineage because she's, he says, we are Brahmins, you know, we belong to the upper caste. So this, she, she's in this very cheeky mood and she begins to question his knowledge to which he has no answer because he's been doing all the rituals without applying himself to it very mechanically. Then she tells him the depth of all the rituals to the extent that it's so beautiful, Amar. She tells him the, the science of um, childbirth, what happens to the embryo right from inception till the child is born, how the embryo develops in the, in the womb and how the baby comes out. And she says, this happens to you and me also. It happens to everybody the same way. It so doesn't what, matter whether you're Brahmin or not Brahmin, it happens to all of us. Exactly. So, yes. the, I mean, this is really important I mean, what I grew up learning is uh, the people who, you know, now 
uh, you mentioned Kalabantulu community, they actually were knowledge bearers. They're not just uh, art and ritual people, yes. but they actually had knowledge, uh, which is inherited for generations and generations. And uh, like, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so what? What's uh, how does it bifurcate into Moniatum? This is the performance of men dressed as women. You know? Moniatum doesn't have men dressed as women at all. I think there are a, a few stray cases of men dancing Moniatum, but three vesham or female impersonation, as it is called. Um, as far as my knowledge goes, Mohini Atom doesn't have that. Right, okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's good you've answered. Uh -huh. Now, there are people who are listening and they're sending in messages saying, look, this is shocking. What is it, you know, if the, somebody who doesn't know much about dance, but these believes in cultural justice, what is it that they can do? People care, <laughs> I mean, this is the thing, you know, yes. people care, but yes. often, they don't know how to, you know, how to assist in the safeguarding process. So this comes, Amar, from the knowledge and the digestion of the point that the dance and the dancer cannot be separated. So this whole thing of transcending the tra moksha, as we call it, moksha in uh, Hindu or Indian tradition where you say the ultimate spiritual gear, uh, step where you leave the body through dance. Now, or the other concept of this soul reaching the higher power through dance, this kind of creates a, kind, a hierarchy. So my grandmother would say, if the, if the higher power is already not within you, don't even attempt dancing. So the thing is, when you understand that the dance and the dancer, and the dancer also should do it that way. The dancer also should be so committed to the dance that it becomes a part of him or her. Then for us, any amount of documentation through videos and books and other things is not the same as safeguarding the art on the dancer's body. So where I'll tell you where it comes from the Kalavantulu, for the Kalavantulu. I'll tell you where I'm struggling. Maybe the person who's listening can help me out with this. I struggle to tell my family members that we have respect out there. You know, it's not true. What you have gone through is over. Today, society is changing. You will notice that no, I don't think, except my father who must be listening to this and my niece, I don't think any of my relatives are listening to this. Because the poster has Kalavantulu stroke Devadasi and they're all shell-shocked into silence. Hmm. So I want people to go to them and say, listen, we respect you. But we respect you when you do this and don't be something else. We don't want you to be something else. We want you to be dancers, artists. You don't have to do artists. You can be software engineer. But tell us that you come from the artist family. Mm. So this is what I tell them too. I say, no, do, you become chartered accountants. But don't tell people that you are some balija or something else or something else. Yeah. Now, <laughs> let, let me ask you a question. Um, and there are a lot of questions and comments coming through. Uh, you know that, that the non-binary of Shivam and Shakti, the male-female principles, mm -hmm. you know, without the Shakti, without the female principle, the Shivam, the male principle is only a Shavam, yes. which is a, a, a corpse, a dead corpse. Yes. Yes. Right? Now, this is something very central to, you know, Tantric Buddhism, Tantricism, but also something that is perceived, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, in the way, you know, the Kalavantalo, the Devdasis kept the binary together in the rituals and the knowledge and the presence within the temples. Yes. Could you 
tell us a bit more about her? So, um, Tantra has always been one of the ways, one of the seeking methods, right, Amar, in this mm -hmm. country. Today, Tantra is, it has got a completely negative connotation and it's only, it's only connected with sex and other things. But then Tantra is, uh, it's a science by itself and it has been a way to seek. Tantra involves the woman's body. The, the woman's body, that's how you have the Devadasi system which has come. But this concept has been safeguarded in the Maharis, the Puri Jagannatha, like we heard the other day. Mm -hmm. There, this concept has been safeguarded beautifully there. The Devadasi system, even if it has, it may have begun, I'm sure it has begun with that kind of a connotation in Andhra and Tamil Nadu and Karnataka also. But later, the tantric angle was kind of taken off from this. It became a proper political social practice, the Devadasi system. It became a social socio-political practice because they were also involved in, by, when it came to Kautilya's time, Chanakya's time, the women were involved in political activities. They, they were taxpayers. The dancers were taxpayers. So they were assimilated into society and they were involved in political activities. So how much of that has really trickled down south is questionable. But no doubt the tantric science had its contribution to the making of the Devadasi uh, tradition. And I also think Buddhism has adapted Tantra to itself. I, I don't think Gautama Buddha had any Tantra. I, I just feel he came as a revolution to these practices. And then Buddhism yeah. took on the Tantric to, that's what I feel, but I... I'm yeah, and much sure. later. Much, much later. later, that's what much I later. thought. And in yes. Hinduism too, it was much later. The much later, yes. Yes. And, uh, because one of the things that you find very interesting in Amaravati, there are about 12 mother goddesses, you know, Ankala, Balislam, all these Ammas, mm -hmm. you know, mother goddesses. And uh, they're all tantric, you know, yes. Yes. tantric feminine representations. Yes. And when uh, I was doing some field work and I realized that they actually date back to what 11, 12th century AD. And uh, so there is this, you know, layers of culture, you know, that is embedded in, you know, like everywhere else in the world, in India too. Yes. And uh, now here's another question. Uh, could it be um, said that the- Just a second, before you go to that, Amar, I just want to say today, the tantric angle being applied to the women of the Kalavantulu today may not do them too much good. No. So no. I don't think we should really delve into it because the, yeah. the minute you say Tantra, it, it, there are all kinds of feelers going up, you know. I, I just, know, it's... Uh, I don't think... And, and, and that too from, you know, colonial sociology of knowledge, yes. it wasn't because there before. Because of that, yes. Yeah. Because and, of that. Uh, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I went on a bicycle to many sites to identify Buddhist sites. If, if, if in the manuscripts, the British gave, were very good gazetteers, in the manuscript, something said Lanjala Dibba, prostitutes mm -hmm. mount. It's a Buddhist. You know, immediately I would mark it as a Buddhist site. Yes, it is. A because towards the end, it was Tantrayana Buddhism. Yes. And uh, the kind of uh, uh, the, the otherness, the way it was created. But, but in terms of, you know, in India, we inherited uh, colonial legacies, you know, this binary of male, female, and the, mor and the mo morality, Victorian morality uh, of uh, shaming, you know, sort of uh, uh, Kalavantulu Devdasis, you know, sort of by stereotyping them. Uh, you know, it, the, the idea that they are sex workers is very much a British and also Indian, uh, independent Indian thing. And it's still continuous, it's still there. Uh, the amount of ignorance that said, that's why we're doing this webinar to Hopefully there'll be many more across India, South India, people will have some awareness and develop respect for Kalavantara community. So 
the question here is, could it be said that female impersonation is more to do with entertainment theaters such as in Kathakali and Godpura, Godpura traditions Godpura. And, dance and dance performed by women has more to do with temple rituals and spiritual devotion? Yes, but Kathakali is not merely entertainment. Yeah, but Kathakali is a very beautiful form, very intense and very, very layered. You, you need to understand Kathakali is a complete test on the psyche. The every move has a meaning behind it. Now, Gotipua also is again connected with Orissa, right? Um, and they did not do it too much for entertainment. They were also connected to the temples. So they were little boys. And the boys, by the time they reached adolescence, they were not allowed to do continue it. They had to leave it at that time. So yes, but when it came to Kuchapudi and other um, Strive, like Assam, Satriya also has the female impersonation. There also it was done to do the character and yes, it was done for entertainment. Uh, not with the Kalavantulu because the women were there. Why did we need the men to do the women's characters? not in the Kalavantalu, not in the Devadasi style at all. Thank you. Uh, another question here, somebody is asking, in terms of costumes, is there a difference between the costumes of Kuchipudi, Kalavantala and Bharatanatyam? <laughs> um, the Kalavantalu just wore a sari. If you see my videos, you'll see that I just tuck a sari and I dance and I don't wear the complete stitched costume as I would I was wearing in Vilas Ninatyam or or I wear in Kuchipudi. Um, I don't wear that because originally they didn't wear that. The maximum that the Devadasis did was wear a stitched sari, a sari that was stitched shorter to just facilitate the dancing. Kuchipudi Today, the costume of Kuchipudi is designed after the Bharatanatyam costume. Um, Bharatanatyam costume is designed after Western ballet. <laughs> Bharatanatyam costume was designed by Rukmini Devi Arundel, who was trained in Western ballet, even if minimally. And when she came here and the movement started becoming broader and the legs going up and, and she had to you know, structure everything and put things in place. Then she had to make the costume. Okay, in India, I, except Punjab, I, I can't think of women's costumes which are divided between the legs continually. You know, unless they're going to the field or do, doing some work, on a regular basis, as, as part of cosmetics, you don't wear a sari, the a costume that's divided between the legs. That pajama, that pant, pant kind of costume has come from the West. So to Indianize it, there is that frill, you know, that very, very nice frill that comes between the legs. So that to Kuchipudi and it stays. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting you said a mention about Rukmini Devi and the influence of the ballet. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but uh, I think a PhD thesis from Germany was um, on this very aspect, uh, but also the other way, you know, sort of how certain elements, you know, from uh, Indian dance were taken into the ballet. So this German scholar was doing it. I'll dig it out if I yeah. can find it. Yes, please. <laughs> and uh, now tell me about you know, like uh, when you get, you know, in Andhra Pradesh alone, you know, over 100,000 Mother Goddess temples and uh, Shakti is uh, venerated. You get Shakti Peters in Orissa and Bengal. What about Andhra? What's happened? So, again, it's about Shakti Peter. Can you translate into English, please, for our audience, people who are not from India? Now, there's a story behind that. If you're okay to listen to the story, sure, sure, I'll tell sure. you the whole story. Okay. Yeah. Then uh, Shiva, whose wife was uh, Sati, 
Sati was his wife. Um, Sati married Shiva much against her father's wishes, right? And then one day when her father was doing this huge, big uh, ritual, it's a function, it's a puja, he doesn't invite Shiva for that and his daughter. Then Sati goes to question and his father, her father insults her and Shiva also. So Sati much insulted because she went there even, even though Shiva asked her not to. She immolates herself. At least she just kills herself there. Yeah. Then Shiva goes in a rage and takes the body of Sati and just keeps dancing all the time. He, he doesn't stop dancing. He's in a frenzy for days together. Then Vishnu says, he, this will not stop unless, as long as the body is in his hands. So the body has to disintegrate and he cuts the body into 18 pieces. It is said wherever one part of Sati's body fell is a Shakti Pita. So when you go to Assam, you have um, one Shakti Pita. When you go to Ujjain, you have the elbow, which is that. When you go to Kurukshetra, you have the foot, that is one Shakti Pita. So it's Vishnu's fault that he didn't see to it that one part of Sati fell in Andhra. <laughs> <Fell in Andhra. laughs> so, <laughs> that's that's, yeah. that's yeah. the background. But then there is no reason why our indigenous mother goddesses are not, um, you know, uh, Adi Adi Uru Urlo Devata, Edo Grama Devata. It's a, it's a village, village goddess. goddess, you know, Adi Grama Devata. Adi Grama Devata. <laughs> That's a goddess who has taken the responsibility of protecting that village. Who has? Yeah. Who has taken, and she's right there on the outskirts of the village to protect her people, right. to safeguard. This is so symbolic and this is so organic. Yeah. So I think these are our Shakti Peters, you know, our Shakti Thank Peters. you for that because uh, I spent quite a bit of my time rehabilitating, conserving uh, Balasalam Mataliguri, the mother goddess, who is the grandmother of the village goddess of Dhani Kataka, which is the older part of. Uh, Amaravati, you know, 2,400 years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but what is really interesting is that there are many rituals, like when, you know, when a girl starts menstruating, yes. uh, they don't take the girl to the temple, main temple, mm -hmm. but they take her to the mother goddess. Because she's temple. more interesting. Hmm? Sorry? Because she's more embracing and there is no ritual there, right? In the yeah. Grama Devatas, you don't have Brahmanic rituals, right? Yeah. It's more connected to the human being. And, and it's the same when a baby is for the first time put in a swing, a cradle, uh, it's usually a sari from the banyan tree near Balslam Mataliguri, the mother goddess temple, and the grandparents come, the babies put it in the in this sari cradle. And, uh, and the mother goddess blesses. And what's also interesting is uh, in Andhra, I mean, I'm going by my work with 23 villages around Amravati. Yeah. When people get a new bull or uh, cattle, mm -hmm. they come to the mother goddess temple for blessing. But now what they do is when they get a new motorbike, they bring it for blessing, for, you know, put it right in front of the temple. Yes. Uh, you know. <laughs> And uh, so things are changing uh, continuously. But one thing that is different is when you're talking about Kalavantalu, is the whole question of internationally, it's a very big debate, appropriation, co-optation. Yes. You know, taking on someone else's, you know, core cultural values and heritage, modifying it just because you got money and power yes. and appropriating it. Uh, in a country like Australia, you, you could end up in court for this uh, because it's a violation of intellectual property rights. So, you know, and there are many cases like this in Australia, and I'm sure there are in other places. But I see that this is happening continuously, and in, in, at least in Andhra, because I'll give you an example. I mean, a lot of our listeners would know who Dr. Kapila Watsayan is. 
uh, also internationally because she was, I think, the longest serving executive board member from India on the UNESCO executive board. So internationally quite well known. And Dr. Kapila Vatsayan came to Hyderabad and uh, there was a Banjara dance as they call her. And she got so upset. She got up, went to the stage. She said, so are you from the Banjara community? They said, no, ma'am. So where are you from? Where did you learn? Oh, we learned it in the technical college. We, you know, it is a six week course. And you pay fees, you learn for six weeks, and then you're actually performing for money yes. at, a, at, at a function. So this is middle-class India taking away the livelihood of people. So, you know, we, to what extent is the livelihood of Kalavandala community being, has been taken away, being taken away, and uh, is there anything we can do about it? Has been taken away. Completely, completely, because first of all, they were demoralized and they were said they dance well because they have no character. So who would want to dance well? This is something I heard too, Amar. Oh, you dance very well. You're very good looking because you come from those families. Okay. So one, second thing is they the repertoire has been taken, I told you about that parallel development of the other dance forms during the nationalist movement, right? When these women were told they, are, they should not be dancing they, because it shows that they have no character and they were stripped of their dance, their economy. This comes because Amar, dance is seen as some dance of the nymphs in heaven or only the privileged dance, only the blessed ones dance. They don't see dance as the economy for a whole family, whole yeah. group of people. It is their livelihood. It is their personality. When I talk to these women, my, my own aunts and others who are in the villages, I go and talk to them and I tell them, Sari, you tell me about that person who, whom you loved very much, she will not tell. She will sing a padam or she will sing a yeah. javali. She doesn't know how to, to talk about it. She only knows how to dance it. Can yeah, anybody... Because she's a knowledge person, it's cryptic. It's cryptic, yes, right? It's cryptic. And yeah. that's all she knows. She only knows yeah. to dance. Yeah. That's all she can... That, that's what is part of her body. So what are you stripping her of? You're stripping her of her one part of her, right? You can actually visualize tearing her into two pieces. This is what has been done. This has been accepted over the generations, not just accepted. This is a conscious move that is done, Amar, that they do not want to go back to singing and dancing. My parents were exemplary. They were very happy when I wanted to dance and they put me into dancing. But Others do not want to come to singing and dancing. What can be done about it is tell, please tell my cousins and nieces and grandchildren. That they will <laughs> we'll be work get... on this. We'll work on this. I, I but, really mean it. No, but tell them one that they will yeah. get a see, seat in their school only if they dance. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> but one last question, because we're almost out of time. No, I'm sorry. How do you differentiate devotional dances uh, dance performance from other life cycle dance performances in terms of creativity and spirituality? Okay. Um, creativity in the other life cycle dance performances, there is no creativity. You, there, you don't change anything. You just do it that way. Uh, when we are talking about the Desi dances, the indigenous dances. Because if you change anything, then the whole, the whole structure falls apart, you know. When it comes to these creative dances of the Devadasis or the Kalavantulu, what is done now is not done 10 minutes later. If I have to do the same piece 10 minutes later, I will not do it the same way. So it is just creating every time. And that comes out of sheer involvement, becoming one with the art. Because my life and my art are not two different things. It is the same. Um, 
Yeah, I think I've answered. And that's your being. I mean, yes, that's dance right. is your being. Yes. Well, let's, let's, uh, I, I think it's, uh, thank you so much for talking about this and uh, hope, uh, you know, some people from your community are listening and they feel proud uh, yes. that, uh, that we are talking about it in the public domain and how invaluable this heritage is. Yes. And today's International Women's Day, the theme, we made a choice to talk about this deliberately because of sustainable development goal uh, of United Nations. Number five is about women and girls dealing with livelihood, dealing with dignity, you know, all those things, you know, sort of, uh, because in India, people talk about gender parity without talking about gender mainstreaming as if gender parity will happen overnight. It doesn't, uh, there, there needs to be societal changes. There yes. need to be, uh, a lot of consciousness raising and respect for women, respect for women's values and heritage in, in all its diversity uh, that needs to be there. So it's about livelihood, SDG 5. And uh, believe me, uh, there's millions of dollars being poured into women's livelihoods in India. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I think that money is not the issue. No. Uh, it is the political will and the good will of the will of people. We don't need goodwill because people with goodwill have never done anything. Yes. It sounds very patronizing. Yes. You know, it makes them feel good because they, 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 <laughs> they're trying to bleed, as we call it, when I was working in South Africa, they were called bleeding hearts. Uh, it makes them feel good. You know, yes. Sort of. yes. But there is a lot of money going into SDG 5, uh, huge amounts of money. But unfortunately, the gatekeepers are the same middle-class consultants, same middle-class NGOs, who's, they are the gatekeepers where the money yes. can go. So la my last thing is that I know you have a trust or an NGO formed, and uh, maybe that might become the means. And uh, uh, I would like to work with you, you know, in my, a position uh, with that trust to see how we can actually build respect first among Kalavantala community themselves to respect their own heritage yes. and not be ashamed as to what the British left or what the other Indians have left, you know, sort of afterwards yes. and what the Indians have internalized. And maybe we could do something about it. And I look forward to it. And I think that a uh, lot of people have registered and there's the people that are still listening. There are quite a few, you know, really committed people that we've got in our participants, really, really committed. I mean, uh, but one thing they will ask me because some of them, quite a few of them are architects and designers. Could you finish up by reflecting on, you know, how does the performance of Kalavantalu and Devadasis, you know, how does it, make places like for instance is it inside the temples outside the temples is it in the inner sanctum is it in the eight cardinal points there are so many different spaces yes that are designed through ritual and performance yes. and it also has an impact on the architecture of temples could you reflect on it and also day after tomorrow is Mahashivratri yeah. and I know what's going to happen the, the chariot comes out the god is brought out and there'll be people dancing in front of the chariot. Yes. But once upon a time, once upon a time in Amaravati, it was the uh, Kalavantulu, the Devadasis who danced, yes. but not anymore. And, uh, but <laughs> tell us about this place making and the sure. design of spaces and how it impacts on architecture. First of all, thank you very much for this talk, Amar. It means so much and thank you for, for coming forward to support this. Now about the spaces um, in the temple, the Kalavantulu, the Devadasi, this is Pan, I, I will use the word Devadasi now. They danced, they, they first sang for the God when they woke him up, where there is no audience, but near the Sanctum Sanctorium, it's called the Melukolupu. Then they also danced a little away from the Sanctum Sanctorium, a little due towards the midday when the deity is, has his meal. And 
at that time there is an audience but the audience has not come to watch them they have come to the temple and so incidentally they're also watching her during the festive season which is the seven day festival that they have we have the devadasi dancing in the eight directions whether she danced or she just took a position that we believe that you know the eight directions are personified right each direction is personified and is considered a deity and these deities take their positions to protect the main deity inside so these deities are pleased they are made to be pleased by the priest who gives them food to eat and does a chant and this lady who takes a certain body stance that suits their taste that that's called the baliharana then they also danced when the deity goes into the streets and they traveled along with the palanquin and they danced at different points where the palanquin stopped and she danced it's uh, uh, and then in andhra in the telugu land outside the temple premises but outside the temple but within the temple premises there is this platform on which they did the bhama kalapam and the golla kalapam that i was talking about the theatrical part of the dev the kalavantulu repertoire is that that is danced in the evenings where everybody came after they locked their kitchen up and they sat through the night and watched this besides this they danced in the courts the temple courts and they danced in later much later they danced in the zamindari samsthanas and by then after that they when it became corporate and madras was formed they danced for just anybody who invited them right mm. so wherever the patron invited was where they went and danced it's become a question of livelihood too uh, yes yes it became yeah. livelihood. look they there's somebody who really wants you to answer this question let's make it the last okay uh, yashoda ji said that the aesthetic of devdasi kalavantra dance changed from changed for the modern audience in what ways has it changed okay first of all the costume has changed yeah and then there is a lot more um when it came to the kalavantulu dancing um amar the the again when we had, we'll go back to space to answer this question the space that they danced in was a very intimate close setting not the one in the temple but when it came to the zamindari samsthanam or even the court it was an intimate setting where she sat and the audience was in close parlance and uh, she would actually interact with them this is called the mezwani in the telugu land mm -hmm. where she's hosting the host host guests through her the zamindar host guests through her so when she did this she did not have to wear an elaborate costume and her, her co-dancers the singers and the accompanists sat all around her they just sat along with her and they sang with her so the or the musicians are not relegated to the side they just around her though today even though i say i dance that i i dance as i have learnt it i still have to put the musicians to the side because the stage is different the stage is a proscenium stage it's a raised platform and it's a huge audience once the platform is raised i can't wear a sari alone i need to wear a pajama underneath right mm -hmm. so there comes the slow change that's setting in and when the music also is more bent towards the structured carnatic music that is used now so when i i don't do that i try to stick to what they used to sing at that time which doesn't follow the rules and regulations of the music that came about during the nationalist period so music has changed costume has changed definitely abhinaya has changed definitely because even the selection of songs has changed nobody does a song like okasari ke ila gaye the oh ho ho ide ti rati ra where she says just once and you are tired oh come on what kind of love making is this 
who does a song like that these days? So it's it's nicer to do Sivashtakam on stage or Vishnu Sahasranam. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to, in thanking you, say that like all intangible heritage, living heritage, you know, the color one through the your heritage is also constantly changing. Yes. But there's a core. There's a core, and that core needs to be respected and valued. And the first voice, the voice of your voice, your people's voice must be honored and respected. And that the question of livelihood is critical for sustaining this cultural heritage, for its transmission. That needs to be respected. All these things will become important in India when we start having national policies. Uh, one of the challenges in India that I find is that uh, like we don't have a national museum policy. We don't have a national dance policy. We don't have a, there are no national policies. If there are policies, then interventions can be made. So, but now everything is shelter aside saying public private partnerships. And we know public private partnerships work for certain people, they don't work for a lot of people, you know, sort of, uh, uh, and uh, so we have to work together for more alliances. And uh, I am from my position offering to work with you under your leadership, but let's do something about this because one good example means it, it could have a multiplier effect for others. There are a lot of communities that are being exploited, you know, not only in India, this happens everywhere. I mean, if you, I mean, they're Europeans listening and they know that, uh, you know, they are the first ones to say, oh, you know, the Roma, you know, people still call them gypsies. The Roma, they come from India, but they are the most marginalized people. Under the Nazis, they were persecuted, you know, along with the Jews, so many gypsies were, you know, sent to gas chambers. And they're still at the margins of society, you know? And uh, so, no, you know, everywhere in the world, we have to deal with this marginalization of women because Roma also, the stereotype is the women are sex workers. You know, they're, they're not singers, they're not uh, uh, whatever, uh, but this do dominant society stereotyping the other, dominant society diminishing the woman, continues in many ways as women are marginalized. I think on this International Women's Day, you know, let's, let's, let's make a pact that you and our organizations will work together. Uh, the documentation that you're doing, uh, as long as I'm alive, I'll, I'll work with you. Uh, and, I, and I hopefully, you know, the postgraduate students and graduates can come and work with you, yes. you know, as interns, you know, to gain some experience and knowledge. I think there are many ways of doing with this. But on behalf of everybody, on behalf of all our wonderful participants and all the people also logging in on Facebook, not just in Zoom, people who listen on uh, YouTube, you know, once it's uploaded, I really want to thank you, uh, Yashoda, because you're, I, I wouldn't be patronizing and say you're brave. Uh, I think that's very patronizing. I would say that you're very generous. You're very, very generous to share. You know, the, I wouldn't even say it's passion. It's your heritage. It is. It is. It's your heritage, you know, in all its uh, totality. And uh, sharing and raising awareness of people because in three months time, there'll be thousands of people would have listened to this recording. So hopefully some awareness will be raised. So we, on behalf of everyone, I thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Amit. And we'll catch up again. Thank you. Yes. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank Good you night. for being Bye -bye. here.